Can I tell you the truth? I am really nervous right now, like really nervous. And it's literally all throughout my body. I can feel the adrenaline rushing throughout me. My heart's beating faster. And if I held my hands up, you'd see they're shaking. But I'm gonna acknowledge right here, right now, that this is all totally normal. I'm human. Yet the very first thought that came into my head was, I don't want to look like a mess. It's almost as if I expected myself to look perfectly put together, like some kind of superhuman. So what exactly is a superhuman? Well, it's defined as someone who exceeds ordinary human power, achievement, and experience. And it goes beyond just looking calm and collected on the stage. In fact, it's an ideal that we expect people to strive for in their everyday lives in order to be viewed as healthy, productive members of society. You know, we as humans are very obsessed with doing the extraordinary. And when it comes to our health, we are especially driven by control. We want to prevent or reverse things that happen in nature, like aging, disease, how long we live. It's actually quite remarkable if you think about how far this obsession has taken us. Just in this past century, we have been, been able to increase our average life expectancy from 49 to well into our 70s because we've been able to advance in fighting infectious diseases. So, can the same be done to eradicate the chronic diseases that currently limit us? Things like heart disease, diabetes, cancer. I mean, anything's possible, right? In fact, the Blue Zones Project by National Geographic explorer Dan Buettner has actually looked at different regions of the world where they are living on average 10 to 12 years longer than um, other people in the world, and they have low rates of chronic disease. So most of this is actually well known. We already know how to live healthy. You eat a healthy, balanced variety of nutritious foods, you exercise, don't smoke, but also things like community and a sense of purpose. These are all the things that help you lead a healthier life. Yet, what we're hearing from the media is that we're supposed to be, we're very confused. We don't know what to do. But I can tell you that it's actually backed by science, that all of these things is what leads to a healthier life. So, why is it that we feel so confused? Well, our media wants us to think that. <laughs> and I know this through the work that I do through my health and wellness media company, WellSeek, and also in my role as a council member of True Health Initiative, which is a global coalition of some of the world's most respected health experts, scientists, and researchers who are spreading the truths around healthy lifestyles. So trust me when I say I am for science, but what's happened along the way is that we're seeing the messaging around health and wellness become distorted. We're seeing the shift away from more practical approaches of balance and moderation and trusting in our own bodies and towards this obsession with perfection. We're looking for these holy grails and fountains of youth and silver bullets of health that just don't exist. In many ways, we're also seeing health and wellness become more about how we appear on the surface. So in other words, it's more like superficial health. And it's driving a narrative that a picture-perfect superhuman is who we should strive to be. And that is what's eroding our minds and taking us further away from what true health is. Now, health is something I've been obsessed with for as long as I can remember, since the age of 12, to be exact. That was when my mom nearly died. Her heart had stopped after she had given birth to my sister. And they brought her back, but she was in a coma for a week, and we didn't know if she would make it. Luckily for us, she did wake up, but our family's lives were never quite the same. And at the age of 12, I actually became one of her primary caregivers. Now, that experience really created a curiosity in me about health and life. I mean, it's such a fragile thing. And I wanted to better understand it so I could prevent terrible things from happening, like what had happened to my mom. 
So I went into college, went to study bioengineering, thinking, OK, I'm going to go be a scientist. So I continued on into my PhD work. And I went into the biotech industry as a metabolic engineer and a data scientist. And I thought I was doing exactly what I loved, exploring new ways to develop therapeutics that could save lives. But I felt more and more disconnected from the actual people all that data was supposed to help. And that's what initiated my path in entrepreneurship and health and wellness. Now, initially, I looked at everything through the lens of a scientist and an engineer, precision and accuracy. That was the main goal. But as I delved deeper, I finally realized and I started to see that our health choices are far more driven by our emotions, by our social and cultural surroundings mm -hmm. than any data or rationale alone. According to a Harvard Business Review, 95% of our consumer decisions are actually made from an emotional place. And then we'll find the data and facts to basically validate our decision. <laughs> so for better or for worse, we are actually making decisions around our health about the way we feel about our situation, the way we feel about ourselves, and the way we want others to feel about us. So in some ways, you can say that superficial health was hardwired in us. You see, our brains operate from both a cognitive bias and an emotional bias that distorts and will oversimplify the way we see reality and what we believe in. It's why we're totally fine with bucketing nutrition into good foods and bad foods, despite the fact that, we, that our food and our nutrients are processed through thousands of biochemical reactions within our body. It's why we'll stereotype people in larger bodies to be less healthy than those in smaller ones, even though we all come in different shapes and sizes. And it's determined by age, genetics, and even things like emotional health or socioeconomic status. All of these things will determine what body size you're at. And it's why when we see someone who looks successful and happy, why, would we, why could they possibly be suffering from mental health issues on the inside? So you see, we choose to believe these superficial ideals because it's simply easier to do so, because it would take a lot more time and effort to try to look at everything and understand everything underneath that surface. And that's what allows that superhuman narrative to continue to dominate our minds. And it fuels a propaganda that preys on our fears that we're not doing enough, not skinny enough, not fit enough, not eating clean enough, not looking put together enough. And it's amplified by a $72 billion health and wellness industry that has more to gain each time they provoke that fear within us that we are not trying hard enough. Now, at best, we're probably spending a whole lot more money than we need to. And at worst, it can damage our psyche and our sense of self-worth, and in some cases can even be deadly. So I want you to see that it's not the data or the science out there that's the problem. It's the way it's framed through a lens that's meant to provoke your deepest fears. And it tells a lie that anything less than superhuman is a weakness. So how do we actually check back into the reality of our emotions and really uncover health from a more trusting and empowered place? Well, we must replace fear and control with love and acceptance. So there's this misconception that love and acceptance must mean you're complacent, you're stagnant, you're not really trying when, in reality, it's the very thing that creates change. It allows you to move forward in the present rather than fearing a future of what-ifs. Love allows you to remember that life is not about possession or control. It's about kindness and respect. And acceptance lets you see a situation for what it is, the good and the bad, so you can work through what you go through. In fact, acceptance is one of the key factors that are the key concepts that are taught through this growing movement you're seeing right now in mindfulness practices and meditation. And it's been around for decades through different cognitive behavioral therapies um, that's used to treat anxiety, depression, and addiction. In fact, there was a Carnegie Mellon study that showed that acceptance training was a key driver of the benefits around mindfulness. And it can even reduce stress responses by up to 50%. And when that happens, it allows your body to 
go back to its natural states where it's no longer threatened. You can see things from a more rational, rational logical side of decision making and you can actually see more clearly. In other words, when you stop fearing what is, you can focus on what is possible. That's why I chose to start this conversation off by just saying, I am really nervous. <laughs> So now the question is, how can love, accept, love and acceptance work, really work for you? Can it drown out the lies of superficial health for you? Well, I know it can, because it did for me. You see, love and acceptance was what allowed me to overcome two decades of struggles with body image and disordered eating. When everything first happened with my mom, I was still a teenager, just trying to really <laughs> uncover my identity as a young woman, and. I was just grasping for control in a very chaotic time in my life. And so I found myself gravitating towards media and our culture telling me who I should strive to be. And I became obsessed with being thin, no matter what the cost, because I feared that I would not be worthy or valuable unless I took up less space in this world. Sadly, I am not alone in this. According to a large study by Dove, over 85% of women in this country hate the way their body looks and at some point in their lives have restricted the amount of food they eat because they feared to be a bigger size. Have you guys had that? <laughs> For myself, it wasn't until I started my work through WellSeek that I started to recognize that my book knowledge was so completely disconnected from the way I was really living for my health. I wasn't caring for my body, I was punishing it for not living up to some impossible beauty standard that was set by society. It was only when I started to see my body as a gift that allowed me to do the things that I love as a mother, as a wife, daughter, sister, friend. That's when I started really respecting it and appreciating it. Not for the way it looks, but for who it allowed me to be. Love and acceptance was also what got me through this past year with my struggles with anxiety and depression. After an incident where my efforts to support and advocate for my son's ADHD at his school was twisted into an ugly story and a shaming accusation of child abuse and neglect by his school. And I was reported to Child Protective Services. You can imagine as a mom how that feels. While I was ultimately cleared for this misunderstanding, the emotional damage was done. And it went beyond just a single incident as years of unprocessed emotions and stress from being thrust into the role of a caregiver at such a young age also started to surface. And I completely unraveled this year. I was fighting an internal war with myself, trying to fight these expectations of perfection, keeping it together, being strong for everyone, that even as it was killing me on the inside, until I worked with a therapist to help me unpack all of the layers underneath that exterior that I was trying to show everyone else. And you know, I'm not the only one. According to the World Health Organization, women are nearly two times more likely than men to develop anxiety and depression. And it's linked to things like social stressors, gender roles, and our tendency to internalize how we feel. For myself, it was accepting that it is okay to not be okay. That I finally started to move away from the narrative of I am never enough to I am good enough. And it finally allowed me to see that my vulnerabilities and what, they, what my vulnerabilities truly were, not as weaknesses, but as Brene Brown so beautifully says, our greatest measure of courage. I'm standing here today not as a scientist who wants to give you a strategy or a plan to live a healthier life. I'm just a person who has learned that a life well lived is to recognize your humanity because nothing lasts forever, no matter how much you want to try to control the outcome. And that ultimate superhuman fantasy, 
they all meet the same fate because no one is immortal. Now, that's not to say that you shouldn't be taking care of your body <laughs> or you know, setting health goals. Please do that. But what I really want to emphasize to you is that your life is measured far beyond the way you look to others, how long you live, and how physically well you are during those years. Because life is a beautiful collection of experiences that give meaning to your time here. It's about how you choose to show up for yourself and others and how you work through the circumstances that are presented to you. To this day, my mom is still in a wheelchair. She never fully recovered from what happened to her 25 years ago. And though she worked hard to gain back the mobility she did get back, it wasn't an easy path for her. And though she didn't have that full physical recovery that's more often celebrated as superhuman, she was. She had risked her life to give life. So however you want to live, wherever you're starting off from, whatever lifestyle you choose, I just want you to know that you can be healthy and happy in a way that is true for you, as long as you do these three things. Number one, be loving and kind to your body, no matter what it looks like. It is there for you every moment that you are alive. Work hard to respect it, not punish it, because it will be here for as long as you are. Two, check in with yourself. Don't just keep numbing yourself with more actions and distractions. Really check in and ask yourself, what void am I trying to fill? Or what am I trying to avoid hearing that's really hurting on the inside? And don't forget to check in on your loved ones too. Because when you start sharing stories, you realize you were never alone in the dark. And lastly, be grateful for the life you have in front of you right now. It can be taken away from you in an instant. The present is all you really have, so love it hard. You know, when I think back, I remember how certain I was that I would <laughs> seek the truth about life through science, but what I learned along the way was a far more valuable lesson. That to be alive is to be resilient, no matter what life throws your way. And that's what it truly means to be superhuman. Thank you.